Welcome to the Healthful Woman Podcast. Today is Thursday, July 23rd, 2020. Today's podcast is the fourth and final podcast in our mini-series on When Bad Things Happen in Pregnancy. I hope you have found this mini-series interesting and helpful. I am aware that these topics are heavy, but they are so important. Thanks for listening. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Stephanie Martin, who is also a maternal fetal medicine specialist, to talk about critical care for pregnant women. Critical care refers to situations or conditions that put the mother's life at risk in pregnancy. Fortunately, they are rare, but not as rare as you might think. And since we are talking about life and death, it is a topic that should get a lot of attention. Stephanie is an expert on this topic, lectures around the country on this, helps hospitals with this, and also recently started a podcast geared towards healthcare providers on this important topic. She is a great doctor and a wonderful teacher. Thanks for listening. Have a great day and a great weekend. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. We're here with Dr. Stephanie Martin, who's an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist. She's the medical director of Clinical Concepts and Obstetrics. She is one of the hosts of the Critical Care Obstetrics podcast, which started this year in April, just like our podcast. Stephanie, thanks for coming on to Health a Woman. So happy you're here. Thanks. I'm thrilled to be here. We're going to be talking today with Stephanie about critical care, specifically as it relates to obstetrics. And I think a lot of our listeners probably don't even understand what that means, critical care. Can you you know, sum it up for our listeners. What does it mean to have critical care? Yeah, it's a really good question. So critical illness is when someone is so sick that their life is at risk. Now that could be meaning that they need to be in an actual intensive care unit, which I think most people are familiar with, but pregnant women can have critical illness and still be in the labor and delivery environment. So it can be kind of tricky sometimes to understand whether or not the patient is critically ill because they might look well, but still be at significant risk. So critical illness is that severe illness that puts someone's life at risk. And in obstetrics, when we talk about critical care obstetrics, we're usually talking about risk to the mom. Obviously, if mom's at risk, baby's at risk too, but we are primarily, you know, referring to critical illness, critical illness of the mom, not necessarily the baby. Right. And also she could have already delivered, in which case the baby's, you know, happy and healthy sitting in a, you know, bassinet somewhere, but she could still be critically ill from the delivery or after the delivery. Absolutely. In fact, postpartum is one of the most dangerous times for women and with illness and um, things like high blood pressure, bleeding, stroke. Those those things commonly happen postpartum, so that you're, you're absolutely right. Right, and so other than so bleeding is a very common one, uh, and high blood pressure preeclampsia is another one. Stroke is obviously a rare one. But what other sort of conditions that people may have heard about would be potentially uh, life threatening for the mother around the time of delivery or during pregnancy? Well, infection is a big one. So infection that could lead to something we call sepsis, which is a severe infection that can cause organs to shut down, kidney failure, lung failure, et cetera. Blood clots are another big one. So a blood clot can develop in the legs, for example, and then it can travel to the lungs and that can cause pretty significant illness. Another way to kind of think about this is some women come into pregnancy with significant medical problems that put them at risk for getting critically ill. For example, she could have diabetes or high blood pressure or kidney problems. And then, you know, the patient, the family are usually tuned in a little bit that I'm at high risk for a problem. But a lot of these things happen to low risk women or women who don't necessarily know that they have a problem, like maybe they had high blood pressure that wasn't diagnosed. So like hemorrhage or infection, blood clots, these can happen to really anybody. Right. And that's important because, you know, someone walks into pregnancy with quote unquote high risk conditions, you know, as you said, they're sort of they're tuned to it. They understand it may happen. They may already have other doctors who help take care of them. And they're more on top of those things. But for many women, they're perfectly healthy. They're young. There's nothing going on. And then boom, they're suddenly critically ill. And they may not be in a setting 
where there's a lot of people who can take care of them during that situation. That's absolutely correct. And that's why it's so important that hospitals, doctors, nurses have programs and processes in place to recognize when somebody is getting sick and may need to be moved somewhere else or have some sort of intervention to make sure that mom doesn't get too sick in the location that she's in or that she gets moved before bad things happen. I mean, I think most patients know somebody who's had a baby and the baby's had to move from the hospital where they were born and be brought to another hospital where they have an intensive care unit for babies. I think that's a fairly common occurrence that we're all, you know, that most of our patients are, are aware that that can happen. But it doesn't happen as commonly for mothers, and it really should. And I think in the next several years, we're going to see a lot more structure around this and a lot more movement of moms, ideally before they ever show up in labor, so that patients are delivering at the right hospital for their specific situation. But if they're low risk, and let's say they develop a severe infection or severe high blood pressure, and the, the place that they're at just can't take care of them, that everybody is comfortable and knows the way to get that patient to the care that she needs. Right. And one of the things that, that I want to focus on, because it's so important in what you were saying, is a lot of people don't consider that adults would have to switch hospitals from one to another. Most people believe that, you know, you go into hospital, you know, if it's if it's a very small community hospital, fine. But if you go into sort of a medium-sized hospital, they have an emergency room, they have operating rooms, they have an intensive care unit even, some of those places might still not be equipped to take care of pregnant women or postpartum women. And why is that? The golden question. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> yes. Well, I think there's a lot of reasons for this. But one of the big reasons is that hospitals have not been required up until the last several years. Hospitals have not been required to say this is what we can take care of when it comes to pregnant women. So just to give you some background, let's think of newborn babies, okay? So each hospital currently, everywhere in the United States, has to say, these are the conditions that we can take care of for these babies, whether it's a baby with a heart defect, may or may not be able to be delivered or taken care of at this at one hospital. A baby that's very premature can only be taken care of at certain hospitals. And those structures have existed since the late 70s, early 80s. So they're very well ingrained. The same thing goes for trauma. Like if you get in a car accident, the ambulance is not going to just take you to the closest hospital. They're going to take you to a trauma center that has a whole program built around this is what we can take care of. So that means they have all the equipment necessary. They have the physical space. All the nurses and physicians are work together with simulation and with teams. They have protocols, processes, so that everybody's ready to take care of those issues. Frankly, that does not exist in the world of obstetrics. It's kind of left up to each individual hospital to kind of handle it on its own. And only in the last few years has there been structure being implemented on a state-by-state -state level so that hospitals are now having to say, we take care of these problems, but if the mom gets sicker than this, she needs to go somewhere else. Right. And so like people may have heard uh, either from their doctors or maybe even a television show, like this is a level three trauma center, or this is a level two NICU. And the levels indicate sort of what, what they are. And there's, there's standard definitions, usually in each state. And so everyone's on the same page for who needs to go to the right place. Again, like you said, for trauma or for newborn babies. And so the ambulances know, the doctors know, everyone in that field knows, but we don't have that for pregnant women and for obstetrics in general. It's coming. Five years ago, the first levels of maternal care were published and they're just being implemented across the country. And some states are ahead of the curve and some are lagging a little bit behind. Right now it's completely optional, but we're starting to see some movement. And this is this is my passion. I'm, I'm so glad to see something happening around this because none of this is meant to punish anyone. This is all about making sure that moms get the right care. And then, you know, on another level, if you think about it, this is not just about, okay, does this big hospital in this big city have everything that they need? But do we know what the women in the more rural areas have access to? And do we know how we're going to get them to where they they 
the care that they might need if we're able to plan. And what are we going to do if there's an emergency? Where does she go? And how are we going to get her there? It's really fundamental questions. And I suspect that most of your audience is probably shocked right now that this doesn't actually happen because like you said there's just kind of this assumption that everybody's ready for everything and unfortunately that's not always the case. Right and I think that historically a lot of the reason this may have happened is the conditions we mentioned that could happen to pregnant women so bleeding hemorrhage infection strokes heart attacks blood clots these are things that happen to non-pregnant women and to men. And so the thought was, oh, well, if we can handle hemorrhage in anybody, we can handle hemorrhage in a pregnant woman. If we can handle infection in anybody, we can handle in pregnant women. So the thought was they would sort of get lumped together with the medical patients. Everyone sort of knew that newborns are obviously much different and people who have trauma and need, you know, trauma surgery and all that might be different. But in fact, that's not correct because, you know, I know as you know, obviously, but many of our listeners might not, treating pregnant women, diagnosing them, treating them is different, not just because there is a baby inside of them when they're pregnant and there are some logistical issues to deal with, like what can you do that you can't do, you know, what can and can't you do and whether you have to deliver or not, but even postpartum, their bodies function differently. Their physiology is different and not everybody either knows that or knows enough about it to treat them well. Absolutely. And there's fear, right? So oh my God, I mean, yes. we have to talk about the <laughs> elephant in the room. I yeah. mean, everybody who's not an obstetrician or an obstetrical nurse is terrified to take care of pregnant women because they're terrified they're going to do something wrong and that something bad is going to happen that they're going to be blamed for because all healthcare providers want to do their best job and take good care of patients. And I haven't met anybody who doesn't <laughs> want to do that. So they're terrified when they feel like they don't know how to take care of this patient or that they are medical legally at risk for doing something wrong that they, they don't know what they don't know. So yeah, pregnant women are very, very different than non-pregnant patients. Their physiology, I mean, just take something as simple as a blood pressure. A normal blood pressure in a pregnant woman can easily be in the 90 to 100 over 50s to 60s. Now, if an elderly patient comes into an emergency room with that blood pressure, I mean, it's all hands on deck emergency situation. And so just understanding things as simple as blood pressure and pulse and how they differ in pregnant women can be scary to non-obstetric providers. Critical care is something that to some degree happens every day on a labor floor, but some things are very rare on even a very busy labor floor. Like even a very busy labor floor, you're not going to have a lot of women, fortunately, who have heart attacks, cardiac arrest. It happens, but it's very rare. So, you know, the obstetricians who see pregnant women every day and are on the labor floor are usually very comfortable managing things like hemorrhage, infection that happen all the time. But if a pregnant woman has a condition that's rare, both for the obstetrician and pregnant women are rare for people who sort of work in an intensive care unit, you need a place that's used to collaborating together, working together, you know, to figure that out and what to do and has people like, you know, seasoned nurses who are comfortable with patients like this or maternal fetal medicine specialists who maybe see a little bit more of this or people who work in intensive care units but have more experience with pregnant women to try to figure that out. And like you said, it's not, you wouldn't always know based on what hospital you're in if they have that or not. Right. And you know, you made the point that there's a lot of a lot of these women, you know, they're on labor and delivery and they've got critical illness that the docs are dealing with all the time. And that happens a lot. And pregnant women, one of the, the fascinating and amazing things about pregnant women is that they can be very, very ill and still appear well. Right. And so when they do start getting really sick, that's obvious to everyone in the room things go down, get very, very bad, very quickly. And so you have to make decisions quickly. So making sure that your team recognizes things before they're in that crisis stage, you know, that, that something is happening before she's, for example, unconscious, that we under recognize things are happening. That's what's so important about the teams taking care of these patients and that they have processes in place so they recognize all of this. And then once Hopefully it doesn't happen, but it does all the time. Once she's now undeniably critically ill, she's unconscious, she's in cardiac arrest, you know, she can't breathe, whatever the horrible situation is, 
we now know what teams to call, who's going to be there, and where this patient needs to be taken care of, whether she's going to stay on labor and delivery, are we moving her to an intensive care unit, who's going to be the physical person at the bedside managing this patient, can they communicate effectively with each other, do they all understand what's happening during pregnancy? I tell my patients, if you just to think about the heart just for a minute, because I, I just love the heart, but uh, you know, the heart has to work incredibly hard during a pregnancy. It has to work about 40 to 50% harder for months. And so, you know, just something as little as that. Now, if we add extra stress on top of that, like for example, she loses blood or develops an infection, there's there's less reserve there because her heart's already been working so hard for so long. And so things can get bad very, very quickly. But if you're the doctor or the nurse and you don't know this about the patient, you don't know that her heart is already working 40% harder than, it, than a non-pregnant adult, you're not necessarily going to understand how bad things can get so quickly. Right. And this has also become such an important topic recently, or it's it's always been important, but people are talking about it more, more fortunately, that there is a rate of maternal mortality in the United States, women who die during pregnancy or shortly after delivery. And that rate is higher than everyone would like it to be. Obviously, if it's more than zero, it's higher than anyone would like it to be. Uh, there are some deaths that you know are determined maybe are unpreventable, that just, you know, these things happen. It could not be prevented. And it's a tragedy. But many of these deaths, when we look back at them, we say, oh, this was preventable. We could have done A, B, or C. And so much of that is not, oh, a nurse screwed up or a doctor screwed up. A lot of that is what you're saying, like systems. And if someone comes to a hospital where the closest hospital that could properly take care of her is a three-hour drive away, what do you do? Now, if there's a system in place where you recognize in advance and say, hey, we're not capable of doing A, B, and C. If someone with those things comes in, here's our plan. We have a helicopter system, we have whatever, you know, there's something that we're going to be able to, you know, medevac the patient and get it done. But if that process is not in place, you know, you can have these preventable deaths occur. And the, it's also compounded by the fact that the deaths seem to disproportionately affect minorities and people who maybe have less resources economically because, you know, there's a lot of complicated reasons why that occurs. But one of them seems to be that they frequently get care at places that have a lower level of care and they aren't sent to higher levels of care. And that's one of the you know major problems we have in this country with you know taking care of pregnant women. Yeah. I mean there's a lot to 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 process kind of in what you said, but absolutely the maternal mortality rate, the rate at which moms are dying, either pregnant or postpartum in the United States, is frankly unacceptable. And it's higher than all other developed nations. I mean, we are winning this race <laughs> and it's on the rise. It's not decreasing. And there's lots and lots of reasons for that. What's also not arguable is that women of color and of lower socioeconomic status and older moms are dying at absolutely unacceptable rates, like eclipsing those of Caucasian women and women with resources. We don't completely understand why this is happening. You know, these are the same group of patients who are at risk for high blood pressure and diabetes at higher rates than, than other ethnicities. But whatever the reasons are, we got to start dealing with it. And we can't fix genetics, okay? We can't fix every pre-existing condition, every every di diagnosis. You know, I can't cure every pregnant woman of diabetes and high blood pressure before she gets pregnant. But what we can do is make sure that every pregnant woman is getting the right type of care at the right place at the right time. So that when she goes to her local facility where she thinks she's going to have her baby, everybody there knows whether or not she is too high risk to deliver there or not. And if not, she gets to the right place. Right. And so that's where we get to this level of maternal care distinction we were talking about before, where hospitals, in addition to sort of being recognized as a certain level for trauma or a certain level for newborns, they're recognized as a certain level for maternal care. And this is something you're doing professionally. Yes? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I got so passionate about this that I... I started a company to help hospitals do this because while 
frankly, many hospitals are already doing this. There was no way for them to know where their gaps were, you know, what was the standard, like what kind of services do I need if I need to be a level, if I want to be a level three hospital, or if I'm a level one hospital, what's, what patients have to go somewhere else. So level one is the uh, lowest level, meaning normal patients, lowest risk, you know, these are the patients delivering at term without a lot of other medical complications, all the way up to level four, which is we've got an, an, an intensive care unit for pregnant women. We've got pretty much every subspecialty you can imagine. Think your large university centers, large centers, and large metroplexes. So we started clinical concepts and obstetrics to go help hospitals figure out where they are. We do a full analysis and say, okay, here's where we are you are here, you have these level of services, you say that your community needs this and you want to provide this, well, here's what it's gonna to take to get there and then we help them do it because all the providers there, the nurses and the doctors, they've all got full-time jobs, they're taking care of patients. We help kind of come in and project manage where what they need. If they wanna build an obstetric intensive care unit, we can help them do that, train their teams, teach them simulation, educate them, whatever needs to be. But a lot of hospitals just don't know where they stand and then how to get, or if they do, okay, if we're here and we want to get to there, how are we going to do that? And that's, that's kind of where we come in. And it's a blast. I absolutely love working with these teams. And who is it from the hospital that would be looking to do this? Is it the sort of the overarching sort of administrators and directors of the hospital, or is it the people from obstetrics specifically? In order for this type of thing to be successful, all of the executives at the hospital must be fully on fully on board. So that means they usually have a, a physician who handles the medical side of things, a nurse in charge of all the nursing operations. And then you've got, you know, just like with any business, your C chief executive officer, your chief operating officer, frankly, all of them have to be on board for something of this scale to actually take place. But the people that come to us are usually nurses and physicians who have worked with us, who have heard us speak on the topic, who know another client we've worked with or something like that, who come to us and say, we need your help. Please come help us figure out how to get this because we need to do this better. And then we work with their, you know, we work with their teams to make it happen. And so when you come in, is it more common that they think they're at a certain level, but they're not? You know, is that something that happens a lot? They're like, oh, we think we're here and we want to do better. And you're like, you're not even there. Or is it normally, or do, or do people usually have a good assessment of where they are currently? Most places think they're a higher level than they actually are. Wow. That's uh, that's that's not a good sign. It's not. <laughs> and it's just because the intentions of all of the providers and the executives are good don't doesn't mean that you have everything you need to provide good care. And so that's why it's so important, I think, to have an independent third party come in and say, this is just what we observed. And I, most places, quite frankly, are shocked at what we're able to learn in two and a half days because we interview everybody. We're at the bedside, you know, we're we're at the nurse's station, we're, you know, the, talking to everybody we can think of to find out what the issues and concerns are. And to the credit of all the people that we've worked with, they, no one's hiding anything. They want to take great care of patients and they realize that they have limitations. And so it's not unusual for us to talk to the nurses at the bedside and for them to say, I don't feel comfortable taking care of this because I don't know enough about it and I don't know how to get educated more. Or for the physicians to be frustrated because they feel like they don't have adequate resources, whether that's time or nurses or whatever, to take care of the kind of conditions that they want to take care of. Right. You know, they, they want to do, but everybody to a person wants to do a, a great job and usually a better job. But most people, and I think that's human nature, Right. Uh, most people <laughs> overestimate their their resources. Right. And there's also, there's no, there's no, let's say, like manual the hospitals can use to say, okay, let's make sure we have these 412 things in place and then we're ready to roll. You know, that's something that only someone, maybe like you and your colleagues or others who have a lot of experience in this and knowing the nuances say, okay, you need this in place, you need this in place. If you have this, you need this. And, you know, so it's, it's a lot of things that people don't even know that they don't have potentially or can't do because they've never seen it. That's exactly right. And what's interesting is because there's been no structure really around how sick your patients can be before they need to be moved somewhere else, that the providers, and by my providers, I mean the nurses and doctors at the bedside taking care of patients, they think that because they have really sick patients that they're 
able to take care of those really sick patients. So I always tell them your level of care is not determined by how sick your patients are. Your level of care is determined by how prepared you are to take care of those sick patients. Right. Because even if you're unprepared, you can get away with it, so to speak, most of the time, because most of the time with these critical illnesses, women will recover and do okay as long as you yep. do enough. But but you yeah. want to not just do enough, you want to do it perfectly because every now and again, it doesn't work. Right. And the thing is, so you mentioned earlier about preventable death. So the the majority, this is the good news, bad news, the majority of maternal deaths, when we look back at, at women who have died during pregnancy and postpartum and say, why did they die? The data from state to state to state is consistent. The majority could have been prevented. That means we could have done a better job. It's not inevitable that someone, you know, gets critically ill and dies. In fact, most pregnant women who get sick recover and have good outcomes. But when they do die and we look back, we could have done a better job most of the time. And that's an opportunity. So that's the good news. That means we can get better. That means we can improve the care for women. That means fewer women have to die. But the bad news is right now we're not doing as good a job as we could be doing. Right. So why wouldn't every hospital just be level four? You know, why would any hospital, quote unquote, settle for being a lower level, like one or two or something like that? And that's a really good question. So first of all, it costs a lot of money to maintain all the resources that you need to be a level four. And that means all the subspecialty doctors that have to be on staff and available around the clock, all the equipment, the physical space, a lot of money that's necessary. But on a bigger scheme, most communities don't need multiple level four centers. So it really comes down to the what the community demand is, like how many patients are you taking care of? How sick are they? You know, what are the type of things that you're seeing? And then what's the community need? Because if you have too many level four centers, then they don't have enough. Each one won't have enough patients to actually keep the skills up of all the people taking care of these patients. Right. And I think that that's a very important thing. And that's, I mean, this is really complicated economics. And I don't just mean economics like money. I mean, sort of like, how do you allocate for resources? And mm -hmm. if every hospital were, were level four, forget about the fact that they'd all run out of money because there isn't enough money to pay for all that. Even if we, you know, somehow came up with the money, there aren't enough doctors who could do, right. who could fill all those positions. Because to be level four, like you said, you need certain services available 24 seven. And so to do that, you need a certain number of doctors who are so specially trained and they just don't exist. And on top of that, even if they did exist, the volume is not high enough to keep them adequately trained. If you stop doing things, you won't be good at it anymore. And so there is that balance between not having too few, but not having too many exactly where that lies. You know, I guess no one knows for sure, but you hope it reaches a steady state, but then for the hospitals that are at a lower level, there is a good system in place to quickly upgrade them, so to speak, from a one to a two or a two to a three and, and you know, however it needs to be done so you can get around that problem of every hospital not being a level four. Well, and the good news is we, in the obstetric world, we already have a system that's been functioning for 40, 50 years, and that's the neonatal levels of care. Patients have accepted this. So for example, if I have a patient whose baby has a heart defect and she's planning on delivering at a facility that has a level two nursery, that means that they cannot take care of this baby with that heart defect. And when I tell that patient, I know you wanted to deliver at this hospital, but your baby is too, going to be need more than that hospital can give, you're going to have to deliver at this other hospital. They never complain. Right. They want to know ahead of time. You know, it may be inconvenient, it may not be what they want, but they ultimately want their baby to be well and taken care of. And so it's the planning ahead and the education and then they can learn about the facility and figure out, you know, how are they going to get there when the time comes and we can plan and work through all of this rather than her just showing up at this facility, delivering her baby that then gets air flighted to another hospital and she's separated from her baby until she's safe to be discharged. Right. And there's definitely, as you said before, there's a, been a lot of movement in this in the past several years with more and more states and more and more hospitals 
really trying to figure this out, you know, which hospitals are what level and how we can get this in place for many reasons. One of them is because it is recognized by all of them that maternal mortality is a major problem and has to be corrected. And also just, you know, to try to figure out in terms of resources, where should we allocate them? Where should we put them? And so I do think that there's a lot of movement and it's great that you're around to help them because there aren't a lot of people who would know how to help them. How how did you get into this in the first place? I mean, just critical care in general. How did you become such an enthusiast for critical care? I'm one of those crazy ones. I just absolutely <laughs> love taking care of sick, pregnant women. And it's so rewarding because the overwhelming majority of the time, your your efforts pay off and the outcome is good. And that's not always the case, but it's enough that it keeps you going when you're taking care of these patients. But I've always been fascinated by the physiology and, you know, how things work in pregnant women and, you know, what causes illness. But when I was early in my training, I was lucky to have a mentor who was also very interested in this. And so I basically, every time there, I, I worked a lot and every time there was a really sick patient on the unit, either in the ICU or in our own, we had a little ICU unit on our labor and delivery. I was there and I was at the bedside and I just soaked it up and I worked with as many ICU doctors as I could and just learned and learned and learned and learned and learned. Unfortunately, I had a couple of patients that were critically ill early on that really got me into it and maybe I had a patient who had cardiac arrest while pregnant and I had to do a cesarean section while she was pregnant in order to save the baby and the mom died. And that was like what flipped the switch for me that I got to know more about why this happened, what this, what is this thing called critical illness, and I've got to be as informed and prepared as I possibly can be if I'm going to be in these kind of situations. Unfortunately, that patient's death was unpreventable. She right. had a, a amniotic fluid embolism, which is a catastrophic event that can't be fixed. But many things can. And that's where my passion came in. I was like, I want to know as much as I can to be as prepared as possible. And this was during your maternal fetal medicine fellowship? Well, yes, that happened during my maternal fetal medicine fellowship. So, you know, my training was three years and years two after my residency in OBGYN. And during that three years, I really focused on the critically ill patient. You know, others in our specialty will focus on like ultrasound, for example, or issues with the baby. And I really got into the issues with the mom, the critical illness with the mom. And then when I took my first job, I made sure that I went to a place that had, we were what the place that I was at would now be considered a level four. So we had absolutely every subspecialty that you can imagine and very, very high volume. And it just built on my my experience. To become a maternal fetal medicine specialist, you do an OBGYN residency. And during that residency, you know, about half is gynecology, half is pregnancy, obstetrics, give or take half and half. And we definitely see a lot of sick, critically ill pregnant women because the residencies are frequently in bigger hospitals that have this. And if someone is interested in pursuing, you know, some sort of critical care for pregnant women, it's almost always through a maternal fetal medicine fellowship. If for gynecology patients, it could, there's other ways to do it, like GYN oncology and whatnot. But for pregnant women, it's going to be through the maternal fetal medicine. But as you said, there's two words in there, maternal and fetal. So we're supposed to, in our three-year fellowship, become experts in the fetus and ultrasound diagnosis, procedures, fetal conditions, and also experts in the mom, in maternal. Yes. And each fellowship has its own flavor. Some of them are really, truly 50-50. Some of them are much more heavily on the fetal side. Some are more heavily on the maternal side. And these are things that when we're interviewing for our fellowships, people ask to sort of get a sense of what it's like. There are basic requirements that everyone needs to know, but some places are certainly stronger in one than another. And the same thing when you finish fellowship, you could take a job where you're doing all fetal, all maternal, or somewhere in between. And I think that, right. you know, during the time, you know, in the past 10, 20 years, I think that at the beginning of that period, almost everybody was doing all fetal. And then recently, more people have gotten interested like you in maternal care because they view it, you know, as a calling in the same way that it's so important to help these moms who weren't getting those specialists for many years. Right. And I finished my fellowship 20 years ago. And at the time, everything was, like you said, very heavily focused on the fetus. This was the era of 
starting to do surgeries on the unborn baby and all the and ultrasound was really getting amazing with what it could see and 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 all the things that we could learn about the fetus but i very very much through my fellowship and with my first job made sure that i was going to get that maternal focus because that's where my passion lies i mean i just i love it and then you know since i've been doing this for so long now i i realized that you know i can take great care of that individual patient at the bedside you know all day all night which i've done for the majority of my career but i started getting passionate about helping systems i started seeing the same problems over and over again the same issues the same challenges that wherever i worked and whoever i worked with there were themes that were just common from place to place to place and so i said you know i want to go back and help hospital systems teams of providers deal with these issues that we all deal with all the time so instead of me being at the bedside dealing with that patient in septic shock because her infection is so severe i want to teach teams of people how to recognize prevent and then if we can't prevent it deal with that patient in septic shock you know so that i'm impacting a bigger group of people and sharing the experience and the knowledge that i've i've gained over my career right so i obviously have known you a long time but our listeners have not and just as a, a word to them. So Stephanie is also, in addition to consulting hospitals and working sort of on a meta level for health, is also highly regarded as a teacher and a lecturer. And I know that you lecture around the country on this topic. You've always you know, been very involved with the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine in regards to maternal care and critical care. And you're well known for that. And you recently started a podcast, yes? Yes, it's been fun. <laughs> Yeah, so I was telling Seven, we our podcasts were born in the same week of uh, <laughs> April of 2020. So they're sort of like, you know, twins separated. They're twins. Yeah, they're separated twins, our podcast. But your podcast is really focused more towards, you know, nurses and doctors and medical students, correct? Yeah. So it, it's focused at the, the providers, the medical teams who are taking care of pregnant women, any pregnant woman, but especially those who are taking care of critically ill pregnant women. And Really, what we try to do is take common things and make them easy to understand because many of these things are not that easy. They're, they're, they get explained in a very complicated way just because people want to use big words and sound smart. And so we just try and break it down into things that are much simpler. And one of my business partners is an expert in simulation. She's a critical care OB nurse who has extensive experience in simulation. So she talks a lot about team performance and simulation errors and that kind of thing. So it's it's been a lot of fun, but we keep it short, you know, 10, 15 minutes so somebody can learn a little bit on their lunch hour or whatever. <laughs> right. So the, the podcast is called the Critical Care Obstetrics Podcast. And yes. I think two things you said are, are really important. First, the idea of simulation. I think a lot of our listeners don't know what that means in relation to obstetrics. So can you explain what simulation is? Yes, I think this is one of those things that also tends to surprise folks who do not work in a hospital setting. But, you know, most teams, we talk about the airline industry in particular, they are required to simulate, meaning they have to work in the environment that they're going to work in and all different scenarios. What if this breaks down? What if there's an emergency on board? How are we going to handle this? And they practice those scenarios. They practice them over and over and over so that everybody's very clear on what their roles are and what's going to happen if these things take place. In medicine, this is done a little bit haphazard and it's kind of institution by institution decides how much simulation and what kind of simulation they're going to perform. It's becoming much, much more common, but many facilities either don't do it or don't know how to do it to improve the care of their patients. So we work with these hospitals and these teams to help them build a simulation program and use the simulation to try and improve the care of patients. So for example, we say, okay, we've got a patient here who is bleeding and we run through scenario. Okay, now this is happening and now this is happening and we see what they do. And then we encourage the teams to figure out what the problems are and then how to solve them. And the, the, the science on this, if you look at all the research that's been done on this, it's crystal clear that this improves the performance, how everybody does at the bedside, and that translates to improved outcomes. Right, because yeah, one of the great things about simulation, and you know, I've 
been involved in them, you know, as a participant and team leader and all those is, you know, most of the people who are involved sort of know the medicine, they know the treatment, they know the condition, you know, I mean, they're, they know what they're doing, but when you have to do it as a group of five or six people, it just becomes very convoluted, you know, when it's actually happening. So if everyone, if someone's having a hemorrhage and everyone knows the patient needs a blood transfusion, okay, so if you have five people in the room and they're all screaming, she needs a blood transfusion, who's actually going to do it? Who's going to order the blood, get the blood, put it in? Like all those things have to be worked out in advance because otherwise things get missed and everyone knows she needs a transfusion, but no one's actually going to get the blood. And that's okay. It's great that you know it, but if you don't give it, it doesn't make a difference. And things like that, you can't really teach in a lecture. You can't read in a book. You have to actually practice it. And traditionally, it was just practiced by whenever it happened. You'd figure it out, but occasionally you can imagine things go wrong. So we videotape the simulations that we do, and then we analyze it and give them a report back. So without fail, the issues that we see, number one, is that the teams usually think they performed better than they did. (laughs) And that's, again, again. human nature. (laughs) (laughs) But like your example of who's going to get the blood, well, sometimes we'll see four different people all going at the same time to get the blood. Then you have fewer people at the bedside to actually take care of the needs. But the big thing is the roles, like who's doing what. That's usually not clear, except in places where we go where they have a very robust simulation program. The videos don't lie. And so when you see the delays in care and the missed things that happen in these made up scenarios, but they're, they're actually, they're not made up. They're, we take real patient cases and the issues that have happened at that facility and we translate it into a simulation where we say, okay, you telling me you've had an issue with this, give me a patient where this has happened. And then we turn that into a simulation. And it, it's amazing what we see and the teams respond beautifully to it because again, they want to do a great job. And so when you present them and say, hey, we noticed that this happened and this happened and this happened and this didn't happen and this didn't happen. They don't argue with it. They say, okay, well, how do we make that not happen? And that's where the real change comes. Right. There's definitely buy-in with these and people oh, recognize yeah. right away like, oh God, like, you know, <laughs> we, need to, yeah. we, need to, we need to tighten that up. And then you do. One of the other things you mentioned, which I thought was so true is because your podcasts are intentionally, as you said, they're short. They're not, you know, they're not an hour long lecture. They're really, you know, right. 10, 15, you know, somewhere in that range minutes. And how we make things more complicated than they need to be. I mean, when I would lecture the residents on critical care, and you could spend six years lecturing on critical care because mm-hmm. all aspects of medicine <laughs> come in, we would just same thing say, okay, you know, someone's in, you know, thyroid storm. That's critical. Here's how you figure it out. Here's what you do. Here's why this happens. And you can do it quickly. And they're like, oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. Instead of having to, you know, spend 45 minutes on thyroid physiology and receptors and all this biochemistry <laughs> that is is fascinating and important overall, but not at the moment, you know, and with right. hemorrhage and all these things, you can really break it down to things that are much more digestible and easy to understand, but it does take someone who's skilled in order to do that. Not everyone can make a long topic into a shorter one and keep in the important parts. That's why I enjoy listening to your podcast. I was telling you before, I I like how you speak. (laughs) It's always so soothing, (laughs) but it's just so it's understandable. And this is something that, you know, I would recommend to our residents and our medical students and, or, you know, any of our doctors are out of training to, to learn these concepts that you're trying to teach. What, what was the reason you decided to do it? I've been passionate about educating on these topics for my entire career. And, you know, one of the other things that I do is to help MFMs like us, maternal fetal medicine doctors who are, who are preparing to be board certified to take that exam. I help them prepare for that. And I started realizing that these, you know, when I'm working with so many MFMs, specialists like us that are studying for this exam, and I started recognizing there was a need for just make, tell me what I need to know. I've already studied all the theory of it. I've memorized all the stupid formulas. Tell me what I need to know to take care of the patient at the bedside. And I was found myself repeating myself over and over and over on the same topics. And I thought, you know, and, and everybody was receiving it with this rave review. Oh my God, I've never heard it explained like that. That makes so much sense. Because to me, it was just obvious. But I started realizing it's not obvious to everybody. And 
that's where I got the idea to just, let's just make it just bite-sized pieces of information so somebody can have an aha. Now I understand why someone can look fine when they're hemorrhaging and then all of a sudden they're not fine anymore. I congratulate you on doing it. I thank you for doing it because it is really an important contribution to the education of many doctors and that and what you're doing with hospitals and also in taking care of patients individually really does make a difference because, you know, as we were talking about, critical care is critical. I mean, it's called critical care yes. for a reason. And it's, yes. and hopefully, you know, the, the more people, you know, doctors, hospitals, nurses, systems who can help sort this out internally, like you said, which is what they want to do, the more women who can, can go through pregnancy, even with a critical condition and come out on the other end healthy and take care of yes. their babies, which is obviously what we want them to be doing to be healthy. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Uh, I view our podcast as complimentary, as parallel and not competing. We are colleagues <laughs> uh, in podcast arms and it is great. Thank you. I really had a great time. Thanks, Nady. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www dot healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.